Uh, but now he's again for Anna Collins' absence last week. She was, uh, if you haven't heard, she was ill at Charing Cross Station waiting for a train to come down. Felt she just couldn't make it and called away last minute. We will try and reschedule her as well as our cable for the summertime. Um, before I introduce Andrea Phillips, um, Suzanne Postumus would like to make an announcement about this evening up the lecture. Hello. Um, first of all, I would like to thank everyone who was uh, helping clean out the balconies today. You did a great job. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, afterwards, we will have a little party also at the balconies to celebrate that we're making such good progress with the cleaning. Um, there will be drinks, and the Prophet will support the final show of this year, so please have a drink. And um, there will be music by DJ Andy and Cynthia, so please join us all. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Andrea Phillips, who's currently a reader in fine art in the Department of Art here. And she's director of doctoral research programs in fine art and curating, as well as providing academic managerial leadership across both Department of Art and senior management levels across the university. Andrea also directs a number of inter international interdisciplinary research projects and publishes extensively on art curating politics and public space. From 2006 to 9, she was director of curating architecture, an AHRC funded think tank based here at Goldsmiths, which investigated the aesthetic and political relationship between architecture, curating, and concepts of public display. <laughs> Under the title of public acting, she has generated a series of publications on the idea of the public in contemporary civil society and its relationship with artistic production, drawing on philosophy, political theory, and using artworks as case studies. And in collaboration with Sohel Malik, the aesthetic and economic impact of the art market is a research project investigating the modes through which the commercial art market is an economic and aesthetic shaping mechanism in both public and private sectors. And finally, under the name Actors, Agents and Attendants, a four-year research partnership with SCORE, Foundation for Art and Public Domain in the Netherlands, Andrea has generated art, art commissions, research platforms, publications, and public symposia that examine the social role of art and the construction of publics. So very pleased to have Andrea speak to us. Please welcome her. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here and part of this program. Um, I kind of know a few of you a bit, um, but not many of you, and I'm sorry I haven't uh, got to know you more this year or in the previous years. I think I know a few of you part-time that have been here for a bit longer. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about um, the public, uh, um, as you would have heard from the kind of short biographical information that Mark um, read out, I've been thinking about the construction of the public through and in art, contemporary art and recent art, for a number of years. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the problems with the term the public tonight. And I'm also going to um, kind of go back over the construction of the concept of the public as it has emerged uh, from the Enlightenment in European discourse. But don't worry, I'm not going to, I'm not going to kind of really go back to the Enlightenment, just mention it a few times. Um, I'm sitting here because I really hate this room and I hate being behind the kind of, um, you know, Star Wars kind of thing here. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you here with this mic and then when, when I have to go and um, change a slide or, you know, a PowerPoint, I'm going to nip behind the, uh, the cat, the, the, what do you call this, the, the kind of, I don't know, looks like the kind of early Brian Griffiths work. Anyway, um, uh, so apologies for that, but I just it, I just hate the architecture of this room, and I kind of find it extraordinary that in the 21st century, educational institutions still conceive of this as being the way that we should talk to each other. It relates very much to many of the concepts about the public that I'm going to talk about and to this evening. I'm going to try and uh, not hog all the time and go on. Um, I have a tendency to extemporize, so if, I, if it's getting really dull, then um, wait at me. Um, but what I need to know is, who is, because I need to know this because I need to know whether to skip some bits or not. Who is familiar with Jürgen Habermas' 1962 book, The Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere? 
I know you are, because I have a conversation with you today about it. So a few people, but not everybody. Okay, those people that are familiar with it, um, apologies then, because I'm kind of going to go back over it a little bit. So, because um, I think it's quite an important book. It kind of is a marker in the sand, as it were, concerning the way in which we, are, we can understand the concept of the public. Um, as I have said, I am um, involved in a number of different research projects at the moment um, uh, that largely circulate around um, the idea of civic life, the way in which the concept of um, uh, civility, i.e. the way that we might um, live and work together, is constructed politically, and the way in which art contributes to that in ways that I think are both positive and negative. You might get a little bit of the negative side of it tonight. Um, so that's, that's one of my areas of research, and I've done that through the projects that Mark has just outlined, but also uh, last year I was uh, the co-curator of um, the uh, Istanbul Public Programme that was called Public Alchemy. Um, I'm not going to talk about that in detail in the lecture, but I'm happy to answer questions about it later. Um, uh, so, so this concept of, of, of the, the, the idea of the public as a kind of utopian schema um, that is at once um, governmentalised, um, biopoliticized, as I will go into in my paper, and also something that might need um, uh, resuscitation in contemporary culture is very much what I'm thinking about. So the other stuff that is informing the things that I'm going to talk to you about tonight um, is a, a kind of more recent research project I've been developing with a number of arts organizations um, called How to Work Together. And specifically, I'm working with the show for three um, three London-based arts organisations, that's uh, the Showroom Gallery in, uh, uh, what do you call that area? Church Street, yeah? Um, uh, the Showroom in the East End and uh, Studio Voltaire in um, Clapham. Uh, so I'm, look, I'm, I'm working with them on this project called How to Work Together, where they've commissioned me to do some research about the kind of construction of arts organisations and the way in which arts organisations um, uh, construct, if you will, a certain modus of, of, of working and management um, that I think is quite interesting. Um, some people would say that it's, it's kind of blueprint for some um, interesting revisions of the way that we all might work together. Other people would say it's extremely marketized and commodified. So that's one thing that I'm working at. But I'm also working with a number of European institutions, Tiesta Kunsthal in uh, Stockholm, Casco in Utrecht, um, CAC Bretagne in uh, just outside Paris. So a number of other organisations that are also looking at this, um, this, this, the way in which new arts institutions uh, could be thought through and might emerge um, to operate in a different way to the majority of the arts institutions that we're surrounded with today. So uh, those th those things are also feeding into this research. So that's the preamble. Okay. So. Um, so, uh, as I said in the abstract that I sent around, I'm very late, I'm terribly sorry about that, apologies, badly organized person. I said, drawing on recent and ongoing research into the role of the public in the ways in which art is conceived, produced, and displayed, this lecture will open some questions about the role of arts institutions in the construction of a particular idea of the public sphere. I will argue that in contemporary art, there is a contradiction between the discursive and participatory forms that are currently being developed by many artists in collaboration with curators, many people here, I'm sure, are involved in those kind of things, and the biopoliticized body that emerges and has emerged historically as the public. My argument very basically here will be um, uh, we are flirting with political concepts of a dispersed and differently engaged relationship with those people that are our publics, otherwise viewers and audiences. But in that flirtation, we uphold and maintain the very schema that, um, that produces a kind of passive and silent public. So that's the kind of, that's, that's the kind of punchline I've given away already. Okay, so on the one hand, we could say that, um, uh, that, uh, that the public is, um, is semi-capitalized, semi and there I'm using the top concept of semi-capitalism, which has been developed through Deleuze and Guattari by Biffo Baradi. So the idea that um, our bodies, our way of working, is, incorporates a version of capitalism that is affective 
and uh, immaterially productive. Therefore, the boundaries between um, the public and the private are, are, um, are fractured uh, and uh, um, kind of uh, dissembled through this conceptualization. Um, this is also something that uh, Michel Foucault has called biopolitics. So on the one hand, we understand the public sphere is now semi-capitalized and biopoliticized, so it doesn't exist or only exists fictionally within, um, without, within our contemporary culture. So that's one, one understanding. And that um, performing as publics, as we all do, um, uh, in different ways and at different stages in our lives and our careers and our, yeah, our, our kind of bodies, um, is, is a kind of, um, is at once a denotative and material inscription um, that is also left far behind by neoliberal culture. Okay, so that's, that, that's the kind of, that's the problem, if you could say, call it that. I mean, unless you're a neoliberal, in which case that's great, okay? Um, and, uh, and so <laughs> thus the, the rejection of the public as, um, a, as a manipulative political construction in favor of other non-capitalized forms of being together um, we might call that the multitude, or the commons, or the collective, is something that many people have um, suggested needs to happen, and many people are practicing it at the moment. In fact, um, uh, the guys from 16 Beaver in New York are over at the moment um, doing, a, doing a reading group uh, called The Commoners, in collaboration with the show. don't know whether anybody's been going to those. I haven't been able to get to any of them, but it's worth looking at. They're podcasting everything on the show and website. Okay, so, so that's one answer. The one answer to the problem of the public is get rid of the public and do something else that is structurally and ideologically different from the concept of the public. I recognise I haven't told you what I think the public is yet, but I'll do that in a minute. Okay, so on the other hand, and this is, this is the bit where I'm trying to think at the moment, and I haven't got the answer yet, on the other hand, um, the loss of possibility of the grounds on which we might combat artistic and general capitalization through the democratic and emancipatory processes and space that the idea of the public encapsulates is something we need to take seriously. Okay? So on the other hand, if we reject the concept of the public, then we are left without a mechanism through, through which we might understand ourselves as a collective civic body that, for instance, can um, organize in political space. So this, this is the kind of two sides of the coin, okay? Um, uh, and then, uh, and I'll get onto this at the very end of the lecture, uh, if I don't go on too long, um, one of the key places that we might reconceptualize ourselves as public bodies doing public work would be in the gallery and the museum, I would suggest. I would suggest these spaces are right for the taking, and we should mobilize and, 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 and return them to a different conceptualization, a kind of post-capitalized conceptualization of a space in which artists, curators can work with other citizens to develop different formations of the, of the public as a kind of denoted political form rather than the kind of invisibility of commonality. So that's my argument. Um, and, yeah, I've told you what I do. Page one, about 12 pages, so if you get really bored, you can. Right, okay, so um, let me go on to a theme first. Yeah. 
as an example of the ways in which neoliberalism has achieved a, prof a profitable confusion between what is public and what is private, and has in this further manipulated the way in which the public sphere, itself a historically embedded bourgeois tool of governance, is used to act against the very institutions that a related but now relegated concept of the public upholds, that is, democratic accountability, economic transparency, and freedom of speech. In this lecture, I want to argue that contemporary art also achieves this type of profitable confusion between public and private, not simply through its economic structure, but also through its manipulation of viewers and audiences, the way it programs the public. So here's um, the funeral cortege um, funded to the tune of £10 million pounds, um, by the public purse. Um, and it's the funeral of a private person. Um, and it's moving through space that we normally consider public, well that's it, but, um, but of course it's almost, almost entirely, if one looks at the funeral, um, uh, the funeral, oh, let's start playing again. No. Um, that uh, if, if one looks at the map of where the funeral uh, went, it's almost entirely um, <coughs> private in terms of the ownership of the kind of streetscapes and pavements and space. Uh, right. I can come back to that um, a bit, but I just wanted to open with that um, that little video clip. It's from Channel 4 News, but there's loads of different ones all over the place. Okay, so despite resistance to the term in recent decades, despite the desire and actions of many activists, political theorists, sociologists and anthropologists, etc., to think past the public, to think beyond the public, the fact of the public remains with us remains remains us, remains in us, each time we use the health service, send our kids to local schools, or go to a museum free of charge in the European context. I'll come back to that, to the kind of geopolitics of this in a minute. But it's also clear that our publicness is fictional. It is a political fiction that enables a form of governance to take place in and through our bodies, in our name, as feminists would have said, still say. At the heart of the public is a financial arrangement, and it is on this basis that the violence of emergent publics is based. As we lose the elements of public provision through the processes of neoliberalism in the West, for example, as we lose the right to free university education, and thus begin to recognize the functionality of publicness in its kind of true colors, in other places, for instance, in Tahrir Square in 2010, in Istanbul in 2013, and perhaps in Kiev right now, in other places, people demand their right to public voice, demand their right to emerge as publics. So I want to begin by setting this question, this question of what the public is, within a, a very specific geopolitical context. That, um, in, uh, in, in a European history, and also therefore within a, an American history, because as I'll go on to talk about in a bit, one of the, one of the first things that was exported via the colonization of the territory that we now know as the United States was the conception of a democratic public, and was kind of inscribed within the Constitution at a very early stage, as I'm sure those Americans amongst you will know, other people as well, I'm sure. Um, and uh, and so, so within the kind of Anglo-Saxon and European context, there is a very specific inscription of the public, which is what we could call waning right now. Whereas in other places, one of the things that is often called for when emergent, um, uh, often clandestine and emergent um, um, activisms uh, make uh, force their way into uh, the spaces that are otherwise um, uh, you know, um, not, not able to be co-opted by them. 
there is often a call for a public voice and a freedom of speech and the rights that are enshrined biopolitically, I would say, within the public. So already there, there is a kind of geopolitical kind of tension between the forms that we would call the public. Okay. So let's start with some historical understandings of the public within that context. So given that I've just said that it's a geopolitical concept, okay, so by which I mean that it is it is marked by a geopolitics, it, it, is, it is ascribed to, uh, sorry, subscribed to in particular places at different times and in different ways, okay? So to begin to think about puppets is to immediately locate oneself in a tradition that is both sociological, political, and historical, um, as well as artistic, but I'll come on to that. Uh, it has been well established that the idea of publicness is ingrained very deeply into a psychosocial condition that affects the way in which we think civility, we think our citizenship and other people's citizenship, and that the way we act, uh, and also in the way that we act, or are allowed to act as citizens. Publicness is privatized, it is capitalized, it is a polit policed and governmentalized concept, but it is also understood as a mode that has historical importance in the development of European culture. And I, of course, I'm certainly not the first person to say this. I, I, I'm going to go on and draw from research of many people, including many art historians, um, including many people actually that, that work at Goldsmiths right now, who have also been looking at this concept for a long time and trying to work out um, what's happening with it and what, what we can do with it. Okay. So the concept of the public, publics, public space, and the public sphere, as well as institutions that have emerged or been um, modulated in its name, for instance, schools, hospitals, universities, museums, libraries, etc., um, as well as the governmental inf infrastructures that fund and defund them, is a concept that emerges out of European and Enlightenment principles, and one that is profoundly shaped by the history of liberalism. The history of liberalism actually is something that we talk a lot about a lot on the PhD program at the moment. So it's quite interesting. A number of people in the room who I think could probably answer or answer questions about liberalism better than I could if it comes up in questions. So I should be pointing to them. Just you know, warning you. Okay. And it is also a concept profoundly shaped by economics. And of course, the relationship between economics and the history of liberalism is one that is um, interwoven very, very, um, uh, very intricately. Um, it's, uh, so it's shaped by the cultures of financial derivation and value that economic practices has embedded both historically and in contemporary life. The public is usually understood to be a group of people that vote, have an opinion, and thus have a form of power within federations, nations, states, regions, cities, villages, etc. So publics can exist on a number of different scales, and the, the writer Saskia Sassen is very, um, a very good person who describes that as different kind of scale understandings of the public. Um, and these are places that are understood to be governed on a democratic basis. In fact, the public is nominally understood as, a, as, as, as part of, um, as an initiator of, and a constituted element of what we understand as democracy. Indeed, the idea of democracy is premised on the basis of public opinion. And it is alongside the idea of democracy that the public emerges in the post-feudal landscapes of Europe, and is, i.e., the, the moment of the development of liberalism, and is exported to the US as a founding conceit, as I just said. The concept of the public is specifically Occidental and is therefore not translatable <coughs> into other territories. The public, therefore, is a naturalized phenomenon in the West and with specific forms that emerge after the Second World War and the development of neoliberalism. So the public emerges as a form. Uh, usually people understand the public as being um, emerging in the, uh, in the second half of the 18th century as a term, although of course um, it's talked about before that by people like Locke. Um, and, but it has become specific in, the Euro in Europe and the United States becomes a specific form, and perhaps the form we recognize the most at the moment when we think about public, and indeed when we think about public institutions, emerges specifically after the Second World War with the development of, of the thing that in the UK we call the welfare state. Okay? So that is um, a kind of egalitarian provision and access to education, health services, etc., etc., 
um, uh, provided by the state. Okay, so this is a kind of specific form that develops at the same time as the development of neoliberalism. There's a kind of shift between liberalism and neoliberalism that I can go back to people, well, I will talk about a bit more. Okay, so using uh, Michel Foucault, uh, we might understand the public in this regard as a biopolitical form. It's a form that emerges through governmental procedures and is enacted through our bodies. It is us that engages as members of the public. We perform and demonstrate public, we therefore prove that public exists. Okay, so it's a kind of reflexive, um, circular process of biopoliticization. Bio excuse me. Okay. Over the last two decades, there have been increasing academic and artistic criticisms of the ways in which the juridical spatialization of the public, so public is often understood in terms of spheres and spaces, yeah? So we often talk about space. In fact, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the article that I circulated, I, I try and make an argument for, for, for uh, removing the concept of public space in order to rethink publics. Um, because I think it's a particular kind of um, um, ideographic notion that, uh, that stops us being able to speculate beyond its kind of spatial formation. The spatial formation of public space is a spatial formation that makes us act and think and react in certain ways, particularly when it comes to concepts that circulate around, for instance, public art. Uh, the, the book that is the best on this, in fact, we were talking about it this morning, in a meeting, PhD meeting, um, is Rosalind Deutsch's book, Evictions. So it's, if you're interested, and that's a really good place to start, looking at the ways in which public space has kind of, sorry, public art has kind of, um, uh, what could one say, um, um, helped create the concept of public space, creates and maintains the concept of public space. Okay. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Um, so most of the criticism that I talked to um, it circulates around Jürgen Habermas's 1962 book, The, uh, the Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere. Okay? Um, most sociologists of the public begin, uh, though, earlier than that, and Habermas begins earlier than that as well, with um, uh, Aristotle's description of the division between the polis and the oikos, where the polis is the site of public behavior, of virtue and value making, very important that even in Aristotle we have that conflict, that kind of um, the coming together of uh, virtue, value making and publicness, which are the constituent ingredients that still pertain to conceptions of the public right now, from Aristotle through to the welfare state and through to David Cameron's concept of the big society, which of course is a profoundly liberal, 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 liberal conception of the, pub, of, um, of the public sphere, or the activities that constitute the public sphere. Um, I'm going to just go over this a little bit. I'm sure you all know about this, the policy in the oil cost, but just to kind of remind people, it won't take long. Okay. Um, so, uh, in other words, this is the site of politics. So, just to kind of repeat that. Uh, most people begin their understanding of, um, of the public sphere uh, with Arist Aristotle's description of the, of the division between the polis and the oikos, where the polis is the site of public behavior, of virtue and value making, of, um, of, uh, of um, publicness being constituted by virtue and value making, um, and thus, in other words, what we understand as the, as the realm and role of politics. Of course, the oikos was the site of the economy. So there was a kind of interesting division between uh, the oikonomia, the place of the economy, and the place of politics within Aristotle, which, of course, Jürgen Habermas takes up. It is well known that the ancient Greek polis was physically very small. So Aristotle's ideal size for a polis, and you know, he kind of would lay this out as a kind of uh, a structural kind of idea that one could take up if one wanted to build one. Aristotle's ideal size was, was a location that you could call across, okay? <coughs> An, the ideal size of a polis would be a place that you could call across, that you could, you know, um, that you could shout across and somebody would hear you. So, you know, very small, in other words, in, a, in, in kind of contemporary understandings of, of, of uh, public spaces. And only accessible to those that had citizenship and property. So again, an economic relationship. At the basis of the concept of the public is an economic, um, uh, um, uh, what would we say, a, a, an economic um, um, law. Yeah, I mean, it's a 
the judicial economics sits at the basis of this concept of politics, oh, of publics. Um, uh, so, da -la -la, ba -ba -la, ba -ba -ba -ba, right, so any accessible those that have citizenship and property, no women in the polis, as is well known, no slaves, no barbarians, so nobody from outside of the city walls. Um, no people that didn't speak the language, etc., etc. So profoundly anti-cosmopolitan in contemporary terms. Um, and it is also understood, and Aristotle understood, understood the polis to be the place where people develop their public selves out of the framework of their private oikos. Okay, so the, the public self is revealed in the public and, um, and concealed within the oikos. Um, somebody else who's another book that um, is brilliant on this, a fantastic and very readable history, is The Fall of Public Man by Richard Sennett, which sets all this out very well indeed, and um, is a fascinating uh, and a very entertaining book to read. Remnants of this structure of publicity are still very apparent today in dominant political structures, most clearly the relationship between public and private power, public presentation, and moral virtue. Okay? I think the concept of the big society that David Cameron uh, currently deploys and his government is an explicit um, exemplification of this relationship between public presentation and moral virtue, and of course, economic um, economic uh, mobilization. Hannah Arendt, uh, writing uh, at roughly the same time as um, uh, Jürgen Habermas in her book The Human Condition, um, uh, called the public world something that is, to quote her, common to us all, but at the same time um, uh, a place that sets out relations that relates and separates men at the same time. So Arendt's understanding of the public sphere is somewhat dialectical. She understands it as a place that is where things are common to us all, but also a place that separates men from each other, men, obviously, in these, these particular terms. Arendt describes the paradox that emerges early on in the formation of the public sphere here, suggesting that it is at once an idealized set of relations, it's where we relate to each other and where we are common, um, and is therefore the blueprint of democracy and free speech, and also a flexible and transposable realm of what she calls aesthetic appearances. So, back to Habermas. I'm not going to talk a lot about Arendt, but I if anybody's really seriously interested in the, com in the way in which um, uh, the public has been conceptualized philosophically throughout the uh, con uh, continent, no, no, it's not the really continent of philosophy, through, through the modern era, then it's important to read um, The Human Condition by Hannah Arendt. So Habermas accounts for transformations in the public sphere from, represent so, sorry, from representational autocracy, okay, pre-liberal, pre that is where the sovereign represents the state in feudal Europe, through the rise of trade capitalism, and with it a bourgeois discursive public sphere based on the independent civic actions of private individuals to what he then saw as, and this is his criticism, the rise of new forms of, rep of representation on mass media in which critical public discourse was to be erased. So that's my very short precy of the structural transformation of public sphere. So basically, Habermas recognizes there is a shift in neoliberalism to the ascendancy of um, a, a, an individual member of the public who is a rational bourgeois figure who uh, separates the private, his private self from his public self, and with Habermas it's also always a man, um, and, uh, and then performs publicly rational discourse that then modulates the democratic uh, um, selection of legal, juridical, economic forces. Okay, this is what Jürgen Habermas proposes as a very idealized and important concept of the public. And then in the structural transformation of the public sphere, what he bemoans is the loss of that figure, the loss of the liberal bourgeois subject who is, um, who is empowered, who is emancipated through the development of mass media forms that then take over the, um, take over the public sphere um, in ways that are very negatively or uh, negatively, uh, um, shape it negatively. Um, it's what uh, uh, a few years later 
he de Boer would call the society of the spectacle. Um, so that's basically what Habermas says. It's a very, very uh, schematic reading of it. And I'm just going to quote from him here. Okay, so uh, this is just a, a kind of a particular quote from uh, the structural transformation. He says, publicity, by which he means the public sphere and what happens in it. Publicity is interesting. I mean, uh, later on, other other um, other uh, theorists like Necht and Klug, who wrote a book called *The Public Sphere and Experience*, take up this concept of publicity. He said, publicity once meant the exposure of political domination before the public use of reason. Publicity now adds up to the reactions of an uncommitted, friendly disposition. So he's saying the first part of that sentence is what's good, the second hand, the sub part of the sentence is bad. To continue. So an uncommitted, friendly disposition is, is not a good thing in Habermas' uh, scheme or worldview. In the measure it is shaped by public relations, the public sphere of civil society again takes on feudal features. So we return to feudalism in this, this, this shift from uh, uh, the rational discourse of the bourgeois public sphere to one dominated by mass media. Because private enterprises evoke in their customers the idea that in their consumption decisions they act in their capacity as citizens, the state has to address its citizens like consumers. As a result, public authority, too, competes for publicity. So he's saying that there's this, um, that, that uh, the, the citizens, the rational citizens of the bourgeois public sphere under terms of new media domination, we could call it, he doesn't quite call it that, um, become consumers, uh, so, so are marketized effectively, ra effectively, rather than being people that, um, that are able to make rational decisions outside of the influence of the media and marketization and marketing <coughs> communication generally. So Arendt and Habermas's theories of the development of the public and the public sphere have now been largely discredited. Habermas's suspicion of the media has been decried in particular, as well as the fact that his conception of the public sphere as distinctly bourgeois is no longer a legible or is um, an ambivalently legible characteristic nowadays, although of course one could also suggest that the public sphere is entirely bourgeois still. That the space of the public is to be utilized for rational discussion amongst equals is also decried. So his favorite example of this is the salons um, and tea houses that emerged in Europe in the 18th century. So you know that, that's, that's, the, that's the, the model that has been disputed now in the many re-readings that have been of Habermas since the uh, 1960s. This is a non-cosmopolitan idea of the public sphere that Habermas pr propounds, wherein antagonism is smoothed over and the economics of production are left behind. For instance, in French salons, Habermas says, and to quote him, opinion became emancipated from the bonds of economic dependence, which apart from anything else would seem to be a profound misreading of what would happen in the salon, given that they're also selling artworks, but you know, that's his reading. It is this conception that now suggests Habermas's public sphere is a fantasy. But it is also this conception of the public sphere as a space free of economic structuring, separate from the worlds of production, that is still dominant in what I will now call the kind of, um, or what uh, I don't need to call it, Walter Lytton called it, the phantom of the public sphere. The idea of a public sphere that we would like to believe in, um, that we are prepared to invest in, perhaps, um, at the behest of a, of a more intelligently antagonistic reading of what really happens in the public sphere. Okay. Okay, but there are two things that are important in what Arendt and Habermas said that I think remain trenchant. The first is Arendt's understanding of the flexibility and fluidity of the public. <laughs> Um, that it is not spatially fixed and that action and speech are the forms through which we become public and might um, stop being public as well. The second is Habermas's warning concerning the address, he mentions it here, through which privatized forms of power, whether they are governmental or media conglomerational, conglomerational communicate with their subjects. It is this question of the transformation of the feudal subject into a system, sorry, into a citizen, 
throughout the Enlightenment, and in particular through the French Revolution, and then back into a subject via neoliberalism that Habermas decries. It is a confusion between subjectivity and citizenship, or civility, the mode of acting or being part of a citizenry that is at stake in contemporary debates about political action, I would say. It is also at stake in contemporary art. Right. So, is everybody with me? Yeah? Okay, so let's now move on to, uh, we're moving towards art now, okay? So there are lots of people that also talk very intelligently about uh, public sphere, or important if you're interested in it. So, for instance, I mentioned Walter Lippmann, who wrote a book uh, in the 1920s, I think 1922, called The Phantom Public Sphere, where he basically says he's an American journalist, he won, I think he won Pulitzer Prizes and things for his journalism, and um, he, but he's, a, he's kind of a very, very conservative critic of the public sphere. And he basically says that, um, that, uh, ju that journalism, uh, um, yeah, journalism and uh, the newspaper industry or the news industry is, um, is an import, is, it needs to recognize that the public sphere doesn't really exist. That the people that make up the public sphere in fantasies about it are not intelligent enough to be able to understand um, the, uh, the, the decisions that elite forms of power have to make in order to run, in this case, the United States, but in the you know, nation states, and therefore it's the journalist's roles to, to, to um, translate this, um, translate the difficult and complex decisions that the elite makes to the, the, the unintelligent people that make up the public. This is why he calls it a phantom public sphere on the basis that it isn't a bourgeois, um, it isn't a bourgeois and a rational and discursive formation. So that's on one side. And another very important person who argues against him in a book called, what's it called? The Public, the public and Its Problems, John Dewey, who writes that a little bit later than Walter Lippmann as a response, who says exactly the opposite is true. The public sphere is important because it trans Trans it's a space that translates ideas up from the citizenry to, citizenry to um, uh, people in power, and it's exactly that um, uh, that nexus that needs to be retained in order to maintain democracy. So this was also a very uh, kind of um, engaged discussion about concept uh, about, about publics that occurred um, before Arendt and Habermas, who are probably the best well known to talk about the public sphere, before they were they were thinking about it, and of course. For a rent, she's really thinking about publics um, from a Heideggerian perspective, so very differently from, uh, from uh, Habermas, who is a sociologist. So lots of other people have engaged with it. I've mentioned Met and Clude's book, The Public Sphere and Experience. And then, of course, in more contemporary terms, uh, people like, uh, excuse me, Bruno Latour, um, it, particularly in his book, Making Things Public, or the catalogue to the, to the um, excuse me a minute, Are, oh, excuse me, are also worth looking at. Latour in particular suggests that the public is, um, is founded through the Roman term res publica on a gathering, a gathering of objects, um, animate and inanimate. Um, I'm not going to go into it here, um, but it's, it's, it's a very important conceptualization of the public that has had um, major ripples through the sociological establishment and connects in interesting ways to um, lots of speculative, contemporary speculative realist philosophy. But I'm not going to go into that now. Um, also underpinning all this is um, Henri Lefebvre's concept of the, of, of the um, of, of, uh, production of space. So how space is produced rather than kind of static and there to be filled. Again, very important in relationship to the conceptualization of the spaces within which publics emerge or might concur. Okay, um, let's go to another quote. Um, and uh, here I'm quoting a colleague and one of your teachers, Simon Sheikh, who's written brilliantly about um, the development of um, the public sphere and its relationship to contemporary art. And here he says this, we must understand public spaces, not only in the public-private divide, but also in relation to spaces of production. So again, this is a kind of Lefebvrean take on public space. 
That is, how public spaces emerge through production as ideological constructions and through economic development. So, I agree with that. Right, okay. But, it will be misleading to suggest that neoliberal models of public privatization have completely eroded the imaginative construction of utopian public spheres organized as its antithesis. I've mentioned them before, collective, equal, communal, heterogeneous. Many political philosophers, cultural theorists, and activists have reformulated the idea of the public and the public sphere in ways that evade the ideological presuppositions upon which it's premised, or at least they have tried to. Uh, the Occupy movement, the Indignados in, uh, in Spain, Anonymous, uh, somebody's doing a great lecture at UCL on Anonymous tomorrow night, and people have seen that. All of these organizations, they're not really organizations, collectivities, collections of heterogeneous matter, all propose ways in which the sovereign power of the public, as it is currently understood, in the form of its totalizing hegemony and its manipulation of communication, in the, in the version of, uh, of the public that uh, Jürgen Habermas doesn't like, um, might be eradicated in favor of a dehierarchized form of collective being, one that is often described as horizontal or lateral. Okay, so, um, during the Occupy movement, I don't know whether there were those of you present that were involved in it, um, during, it's still ongoing in lots of different places, but at the point where it was, it was um, functioning on a, a very kind of large scale, um, you know, in various places, I was most familiar with London Stock Exchange, um, the, 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 the kind of parliaments, the parliament of things, to use a Latorian phrase, that made up discussions within the Occupy movement, um, often talked about trying to form lateral, power, lateral and deep power relationships within the kind of organization, for instance, of, of decision making. And any of you that attended any of the Occupy public meetings will know how extraordinarily long and complex decision making processes were in the, in, the, um, in the attempt to try and find different ways of understanding or it, practicing, not understanding, of practicing uh, non-hierarchical forms of decision making. And of course the jury's out on whether um, that was achieved or not. I think from both within and without the Occupy movement, the jury is still out. Then, of course, many artists and curators, perhaps you amongst them, um, support this and make work themed exhibitions around these concepts. Okay, so there is also an engagement with these questions very clearly within contemporary public art, and has been for, uh, I would say, a number of decades, actually. This idea of a, de a de kind of dehierarchization of power, a lateral formation of affiliative and, um, uh, and non, um, non governmentalized processes and procedures. Um, Yet art institutions and art education, I would say, is still premised upon this liberal idea of the public, the idea of the, the kind of neoliberal uh, marketized conception of the public. We are the public, despite the fact that we might not want to be, or might want to be partially, or on some occasions and not others. And somehow the art establishment has been very clever in understanding, and in art education as well, in understanding the slippage between these things, in, in, in providing spaces that are more or less entirely privatized, through which we might express our desire for a kind of natural and dehierarchized uh, space. I'll go on to talk about that a bit more. Okay, now I'm going to talk about art. I'm going to show you another procession. Okay, here's another procession. I don't want you to think that I'm saying that this is exactly the same as Margaret Thatcher's funeral, but I think you should think about the relationship between them. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
is um, Fra Felice, is the one procession commissioned by MoMA when uh, it was closing down its uh, its Manhattan buildings for renovation, where the collection or the the, the process was moved to PS1. So he organises a funeral, a funeral, God, a procession. Okay, I'll just leave it running. Is it distracting leaving it running and talking? Okay, thank you. Right, so um. Actually, I can't because I want to quote, do another quote. Let's, let's move to art. Okay, I'm kind of nearly there, so bear with me a bit. Okay, so to go back to Simon Shea, this is from the same essay which was published in Open number 13, I think, in about two, I can't remember what it was, 2008? Not sure. Okay, so he says this um, We are now witnessing the conflation of public space, spaces with modes of consumption rather than participation, where consumption becomes the main form of social communication. So far, very Habermas, yeah? The art institution, once an exemplary bourgeois public space, is nowadays finding itself in a difficult transformative phase where, the, where its historical role has become obsolete, the caterer of taste and reason, without another critical role being apparent or without another constituency emerging other than commodity exchange within the experience economy and the society of spectacle. Okay, so now I'm going to go through four ways in which I think the con contemporary art and the conceptualizer, in which artists, curators, and <coughs> art institutions utilize the concept of the public and are utilized by the concept of, of the public for um, privatized ends. Okay? Um, and they, they, I mean, Simon um, uh, summarized it very nicely, but I'm just going to kind of unpick it a little bit. So, uh, so. As artists, you are asked on a regular basis to imagine what your public, often the terms used are audience or viewer, might experience in your work. I'm presuming. As curators, you are asked, directly and indirectly, to account for your audience and to measure in some way their experience particularly if you work for a major gallery or museum, to fund your expensive privatised education. This is the first tier of understanding of the ways in which artistic practice is constituted through and constitutes the public. It is worth noting that artists' work became individualised and the production of art became autonomously signatured at roughly the same time as forms of liberalism and individuated subjectivity began to emerge as biopolitical forms in post-feudal Europe. So there I'm making a connection between the way in which um, contemporary artists are expected to perform to their public, whether that public be a buyer or, um, you know, your mother or somebody else, yeah? Um, and the way in which individually authored, autonomously produced art emerged 
roughly at the same time as the development of liberal subjectivity in post-feudal Europe. To me, that's not coincidental. So secondly, the relationship between the public and private is related to this shift to autonomy and privacy of the work of the artist. The modern artist, i.e. the artist as a liberal subject, works privately, in secret, as Habermas would observe. He wasn't on the art, but he talked about the development of things in secret and then they're making and becoming public. Um, that is, uh, so the modern artist works privately before revealing her work publicly, which is the job of the curator, and the esteem of the curator is built on this to help this process along. This reveal is the basis of all accounts of publicity and draws us back to the distinction between the zones of the oikos and the polis, and the polis where in the static and regulated spatial zoning of publicity and privacy is instituted. What is surprising is how difficult it is for artists and curators to break down this moment of revelation into other forms of viewing structures and how impossible this makes it to conceive of different forms of making with the skill those artists have. So the first two categories of publicness that I think are interesting and related to the production, the artistic production, the first one is um, the, uh, the idea of the autonomous um, uh, individuated artist who um, works privately and then, uh, and, and sorry, no, the first one isn't that, that's the second one. The first one is the, the idea of the autonomous artist and the, 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 the idea of the singularity of practice that is individuated and then displayed publicly. The second one is the kind of temporal and spatial concept of the revelation that one hides something and then reveals it. It's the basis of what we understand as studio practice. So the modernist concept of artists having a studio practice is based on this idea. You beaver away privately in your studio, then you let the curators in to have a look to see if they want it in your show, and then it's revealed in a major museum or gallery. Okay? I know that's rather schematic reading of things, but you know what I mean. Okay? Thirdly, it is these viewing structures so the, the viewing structure of the, the secret work being revealed to a public view, or, or funny enough, we call them private views, but anyway. Thirdly, it is these viewing structures that set up a relation with the public that makes the viewer subject to the image object that she contemplates. Elsewhere, I have called this making, this, this the making of economic subjects, by which I mean that the viewer's attention is the value scheme of the economic basis of the artwork. Here, a Rent's idea of attention is perverted or reverted, okay? The attention comes from the public to make value rather than the other way around. The value of work is established in this relation between the viewing subject and that which she contemplates. So this is where I bring in the concept of, value, of the making, of the viewing making the value. And value is a term that is privatized in this construction. Private value is individualized, value is um, owned by the public, by, by the, the, the particular and individuated understanding of um, the, uh, the bourgeois subject, the bourgeois subject who contemplates the work. So privatized um, and therefore economized conceptions of viewing make up this relationship between what we understand as the public in art and the private artist who makes the public reveal. And then fourthly, and perhaps most evidently, as Shape has said, it is the art institution that makes publics. It does this forcefully through all sorts of spatial and experiential mechanisms. Art institutions are now majoritively corporately funded and exist within a fluid network of public and private pat patronage initiatives that has high media profile but is out of bounds both curatorially, sorry, both culturally and financially to most people. This is one of the achievements of processes of neoliberalism as its mechanisms have continued to be adopted and perfected by governments over the past 30 years. Key to this transformation are a number of procedures that have been embraced by the arts. The adoption of the market economy as the basis for cultural transaction, the instantiation of com competition and meritocracy as methods which delineate what gets shown and where it gets shown, you get there through merit, through your natural resources, okay? You can't learn to be a good artist. You've either got it or you haven't. 
Yeah? Somewhere in you, some kind of you know, core individuated cell of specialness that you have. It is enhanced by your expensive education, of course. Okay, right. Uh, and then thirdly, the naturalization of private patronage and its taste shaping capacity. So the cultural industries, arts, arts specifically, but the cultural industries generally all support these understandings. So the relationship between private patronage and public display, the idea of competition and meritocracy at the core of production, and the adoption of a market economy as a naturalized basis for the way in which production occurs. Apart from the most evident ways in which public galleries and museums are expected to count their publics, um, so we all know that, we all know that, I mean, I've got a number of friends at the moment that are um, writing their national portfolio, NPO, National Portfolio Organization um, uh, uh, applications for the next round of Arts Council funding, um, and they all uh, need to say very clearly how many audience they've had over the past three years, how it's better than the last one, and how, uh, you know, that there are so many kids and so many black people, whatever, in that audience figure. Yeah? We all know that this is a kind of obscure and kind of slightly skewed, skewed way in which uh, the neoliberal economy demands these statistics and doesn't give a shit about them, effectively. Okay. So, uh, da, 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 da. so this economic relation is uh, uh, yeah. okay. So this economic relation is identical to that set up in the process of neoliberalism. The free act of looking on the part of the public performs the conditions of the neoliberal subject. The neoliberal <coughs> subject is one that exists within what Foucault calls, and I'm quoting him now from the birth of biopolitics. To quote him, the overall exercise of political power modelled on the principles of a market economy. That's what Foucault calls neoliberalism, the overall exercise of political power based on the principles of the market economy. So the viewer of an artwork in a museum or gallery enshrines in her action the part the public plays in the otherwise marketized economy, in economic infrastructure of the institution. In our looking at artworks, and you're making of them, in my looking at them. In my looking at artworks in the institution, I uphold the critical role of the public in the continued development of a neoliberal culture that otherwise cares for nothing but profit. Our bodies produce the subjective affirmation of art's market economy based on our biopolitical publicness. So these histories of the shaping of publics and spaces allotted to them reveal a culturally embedded idea of spatial civic organization that is both highly visible at an urban scale, at a cultural scale, gets the headlines, and is woven into the psychic apparatus of all of our subjectivities. The very civic public privatization that I've just described is designed to erode, amongst other things, confidence in alternatives to neoliberal civic organization and our capacity to imagine and sustain the development of other types of civic organization, other concepts of community, other forms of financial and cultural exchange. Okay, so the last part of this paper is called Reforming and Slash Replacing the Public. So many artistic and curatorial projects, exhibitions, and I'm on page nine, so we haven't got very far to go, sorry. Yeah, okay. Am I okay for time? Yeah? It's quite positive. I'm just the temperature. The temperature? Too hot or too cold? Cold. Too cold. Oh, it feels warm here. I'm just all moving around. I don't know what I can do about that. <laughs> It's too warm, then you'll be asleep, so, you know, it's better to it keep you, like, you know, keeps you active. Is it really cold at the top, or is it warmer? You can all go and sit at the back. It should be warmer, technically, if I understand. It's cold, very cold. You can always get up and shake around a bit. You can move to the, to where, where's the party? You can move to the party and dance. You can dance and I can talk. Right. Okay. So, 
Many artistic and curatorial projects, exhibitions, and biannuals have attempted to reorganize the way in which art's relation to publics and counter discourses of and uh, actions in the public domain is directed or are directed and understood. High profile examples of curatorial experiments in providing spaces for and therefore making and debating more productive public formats, and I'm not putting these in line because I think they all worked, but um, they're, they're kind of high profile examples of experimentations in this field, or experiments in this field, range from United Nations Plaza in Berlin, in two, started in 2006, ran for a year and a half. Um, the European Former West project that started in 2008 and is now kind of moving into a different sphere. These are all examples of things that, um, uh, that, that are kind of experiments in re, uh, rethinking the, the, the way in which the public is, um, is organized through and via art, uh, artistic production. Some of them remove art from it almost entirely, like the Former West. Um, although they engage with artists, they don't, there's not a kind of, a, there isn't a kind of hugely uh, exhibition formatted, a uh, kind of oriented format, format, format to the, the, the most recent versions of it. Um, various events organized by Creative Time in the United States uh, through the 7th Berlin Biennial in 2012 to things that are slightly more capitalized versions of it, like, well, they're all capitalized versions of it, they have to exist through private sponsorship, but nevertheless, Slightly more kind of um, uh, simplified versions of it, should I say, like the, the Hayward Gallery's wide open school that happened in London in 2012, and there have been many other ones as well. Um, and uh, of course, the Istanbul Biennial 2013, which catastrophically um, attempted to kind of rethink some of these ideas. Here, um, there is often to be found a commitment to discussion, participation, however temporary and involvement in the idea of interdis interdisciplinary methods of social recalibration, so rethinking the ways in which the sociality is performed through uh, the spaces that are uh, adopted and, and forced by the art world, forced into being, should I say. Um, at various distances from artistic production itself, as I said, though rarely, and this is, I think, the important point for me, in these instances, is there any participation in decision-making or institutional shaping on the long term that exists? There is a general desire for an engaged public. Um, so quoting Martha Rosler, in discussion at United Nations Plaza, the kind of key, or the lead artist of United Nations Plaza, Anton de Dolcle, bemoans the replacement of the, of the emergence in the 18th century of public of what he calls, or what Rosler called, engaged citizen subjects with a contemporary qualified and quantified audience. So Rosler often talks about how, in, in a way very similar to Jürgen Habermas, um, in, in the 18th century there emerged kind of engaged citizen subjects, in the 19th century really, she's kind of beginning of the 19th century, um, and now we just have audiences, she says, as artists, and she doesn't like that. But attendance to a body of people called the public within all these experiments, however enfranchised or redistributed, remains in place. So none of these experiments really kind of rock the basic schema of arts organization, which is involved on the reveal, on the artist secret being made public, and of the individuated subject of the artist as somehow removed and, uh, and isolated from uh, the rest of us who are the public. Whilst other spheres have moved on, um, or have tried to experiment in different ways, in art, a utopian and fantastic concept of the public not only exists, but in fact structures artistic production, its education, display, and critique. And I'm just going to finish by reading three quotes from three different, four different artists and, uh, and organizers that express uh, dissatisfactions in quite articulate ways and propose different models um, of, of thinking through some of these problems about the reformulation of the concept of the public um, that I've been influenced by. They're all people that I've worked with in different forms. So the first one is the Turkish artist Ahmed Obud, and he said this in response to the Istanbul Biennial. Um, uh, so he says, it's important to imagine if we lose I'm going to sit here because I've got to flick through them. It's important to imagine, if we lose public and semi-public space, we lose everything. Artists give up their authorship when necessary, and it is the same for institutions, or it should be, I think he means to say, the same for institutions. 
We need to find ways to get out of the art context, especially during historical moments like this. And there he's referring to uh, the events in Taxim Square and, um, uh, and Getty Park in the summer of 2013. I don't just mean anonymous guerrilla style projects. Artists often take those risks, step out of safe zones and play around with permissions, regulations and legal limitations. It's time for the institutions to do the same and get more creative. Okay, and this is something that I'm really thinking through now in relationship to these ideas of, um, of, uh, of, of what new arts institutions might be and how they might take up that challenge that Ahmed Ogwood puts down. So the second one, I've got, I've got two quotes from a, an interview I conducted, or a conversation I had, I should say more to the point, with two members of Ultra Rare, Chris Jones and Robert Samba. Um, and uh, Chris and Robert are members of Ultra Red, the kind of sound art, radical sound art collective that you might be familiar with, you might know about. Um, they're based in different places all over the world, come together in different formations. Um, and they, um, and Robert and Chris are also um, community <coughs> activists in different ways as well as being members of Ultra, uh, Ultra Red. And so Robert says this, by focusing on learning and listening, we in Ultra Red are released from the art world presumption that per se it has something valuable to contribute. Rather, it is about becoming a deep collaborator. If there is a presumption in Ultra Red, it is that constituencies are already resourced beginning with their archives, whatever those may be, and that there is more than I or the art world, and that is more, there, there is more there, really, I think he means, than I or the art world could contribute. That calls into question the autonomy of the art world, which says, we're going to shine our light on this issue of grace with visibility and, and acknowledgement. He's talking particularly there in relationship to the Istanbul Biannual. I fear that the structure of biannuals makes this an inevitable process. The platform they offer may actually not be of much value to a struggle. And there, I think he, uh, in the same way, I mean, he's, he's talked to me a lot about arts and institutions in the same way, and I think that um, there again is a, a kind of profound um, uh, question and uh, a challenge to arts institutions um, to reformulate the way in which they understand publics, not, as Robert says, as um, people that, uh, that suddenly get their light shone on them, like categories of people through participatory projects, etc., etc., but as people that already have a lot already there um, uh, that maybe artists don't have. Okay, and then Chris Jones, and I've got two quotes from Chris. Uh, so again, Chris um, is a community activist, runs and uh, participates collectively in the running of an, uh, of a, of an anarchist bookshop, and is also a, a member of Ultra Red. He says, it's the relationship that a person brings to it, he means to any kind of project, to any organization project. You need to understand the collective process and the effect of generosity and sharing. If people just want to show off and it has no relevance to anyone, and it's of no use to any particular struggle, we get stuck on these kinds of large questions, but the useful thing is always just to focus on the minute relationships that people are building with others. If you can create a space where there are genuine relationships in formation, then that also means, for example, the class politics of this or the other politics of that, who has the confidence or the power to make decisions, etc., etc. That can all be discussed. It's also about being prepared for the long haul. Relationships take time, but that's the joy, a joy. Okay, so there again, I think, challenges to the way in which um, arts institutions understand their donating um, their benevolent relationship to something called the public, but also what we might constitute as new forms of public within the institutions and how we might form long-term collaborations and partnerships rather than uh, continuously excuse me, circulate this short-termism that uh, in particular social engagement has um, been based on. And then again, Chris, curators and arts administration, as administrators want to bring politics into the art world. But what is their position, really, and who are they? Where is their comfort zone? Can they be more honest about things? And what are the consequences for them to actually mess things up a bit? What are the consequences for them to be in struggle with people? What are their struggles? It seems often to be hidden away behind this kind of impenetrable absence and also a weird politeness. That's the thing we don't talk about. What does it mean? Or what would it mean would be like for you? He's talking to me here. As someone who flies around the world from this to that, to have that ruptured for a moment. Oh. 
Right, and then the last one, the last quote is from um, Alice Kreischer and Andreas Siegman, who work individually and collaboratively, um, curate and make artwork, um, and have a long-term engagement with questions of, uh, um, of capital, capitalism and do long research projects. Um, and they say this, and, and their position is slightly different, I think, from Ahmed and, uh, and Ultra Reds, who are engaged in these kind of struggle-based projects, as, as, um, as Ultra Red use the term very, very much. Alice and Andreas uh, work with institutions in collaboration with institutions. Um, uh, probably most recently, uh, they did a project with the Bergen Assembly about capitalism, but they, they work, um, they work in, in, uh, in collaboration and they use institutional form. They're interested in it. They, they, they engage with display and they make beautiful and extraordinarily complex installations. So in a way, they're not, they're not kind of, uh, if, if Ultra Red are kind of trying to move away from the institution, Alice and Andreas aren't. And they say, like many others, we're concerned with establishing coherences between political activism, political theory, and political art. Many times, though, that seems to us like a space that only exists in our own heads, or as though there were a one-way street of political information and debates that we can only take into the field of art and show. And I think it's this, I just want to leave it on this conundrum in a way, because I think that um, th this, is, this is the conundrum or the contradiction that I, I, start, I, tr I try to start with, that, um, that, that we're currently in, in the art world, which is, is based on the concept of public showing. So, so many artists, many brilliant artists, many fantastically and intelligent and, and, and radically theorized curators get stuck at this point in the same way that Alice and Andreas do. What we need to do is find ways to run public institutions and utilize public institu institutions so we don't get stuck at the point where engaging politically through art forms uh, becomes something that is um, disappointing to us and the people we want to collaborate with politically instead of in, in, engaging in a much deeper and stronger way. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. I'd like to um, invite some questions, but we may have to go to and fro with the microphone. Does anyone have a question? saturated by neoliberalism arts institutions have to be. I mean, sometimes I felt there was a bit of a sort of inside-outside thing going on. You know, the art institutions are totally neoliberal. Some kind of contestation has to come from outside. And I wondered whether you could conceive of neoliberal art institutions as sort of internally conflictual with different kinds of possibility. So that it's not simply, you know, a neoliberal and, and sort of non-liberal neoliberal. Because otherwise, also, how, where does the contestation come from? You know, what kind of collective agency will it arise from if there isn't some sort of conflict, conflict internally conflictual structure? So that really is yeah. my question. Yeah, good question. <coughs> No, I'll bring this back. Oh, I can, I can use this one. That's true. Uh, okay, I'll use this one, and then you don't have to okay. So, Mark, I think that's a great question. I think it's really important, and I didn't address it in the talk, and I think you're right to pick it up. Um, uh, so I'm going to answer one pragmatic answer, and then one kind of broader political answer. I don't think that the... Uh, what I tried to describe was not a, not, not a way in which the publics are outside, and then there's the kind of nasty neoliberal administrators inside the institution. The, 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 you know, I, I work in institutions, okay, we all work in institutions. This is an institution, I, I collaborate regularly, as I'm, I'm sure you do, with arts institutions. And I have many friends that run institutions and think in much more radical forms than I do. 
So it, that, that's not a kind of, um, I don't, I, what, I, what I think is important is that we all embrace this idea of the public. What, in a, in a, and rethink it, not just people outside forcing change on the institutions. Um, one of the things that I've been interested in uh, in the Michel Fair lectures that have been going on, I don't know whether anyone's been able to get to these, that visual, visual cultures are sponsoring. Michel Fair is coming uh, once or twice a term to, to talk about <coughs> liberalism. And one of the things that he has promised to develop, he hasn't got there yet, is the fact that instead of rejecting neoliberalism, we need to understand it as a, as a shaping mechanism and work with it and through it. And I think that's explicitly right within arts institutions. We can't say, let's, and in a, in a way, this is my frustration, why, why, I, why I want to make a, a distinction between the public, the idea of the public being an interesting uh, political idea that we can re work with and, and reformulate, and things like, um, uh, things like um, a kind of a de, -hier de hierarchized Occupy movement that wants to resist or, or the commons, for instance. Not that I don't think the commons is interesting <coughs> historically and intellectually, but I think it, it makes a division, the one that you've described, between the outside and the inside. It says that there's a different way of occupying outside, there's a different way of acting outside. I don't think that's, I don't think that's useful. What I'm trying to do is rethink the way in which arts organizations can structure conceptualizations of public, but it does mean rethinking these basic premises of the way in which we interact and are allowed to interact within them. Personally speaking, I've got a great deal of hope for contemporary arts institutions because compared to many arts institutions, many institutions, they are, they, and particularly smaller ones, I'm, I'm not talking about Tate here, I think it would be very difficult to kind of, you know, transform Tate, although, you know, I think it, that there are many people that work in Tate that would like to have a go. Um, but I think that smaller arts organisations, medium-scale arts organisations, have a looseness about their capacities and particularly their, their, you know, their, their, their statuses, their charitable statuses, their relationship with their trustees and their boards, where these kinds of experiments can happen. So I think at a pragmatic level, the medium scale institution is not somewhere where we should kind of throw eggs out from the outside. It is something that we should engage with very clearly internally. And believe me, in my experience, there are many, many directors of arts institutions that are are trying to do it already and are reformulating it. The important thing, and the thing that I want to stress in this lecture, was that um, it's even even in some of the most radical kind of restructuring experiments, because of time frames and because of spatial arrangements, those things are often limited and re-enfranchise a concept, an idea of the public, both um, semantically and also practically. And it's that like so. It's, I'm, I'm suggesting that rethinking the public is one is one of the starting points we might use to rethink what arts organisations do in a broader culture. But I don't think we should reject them at all. No. But can I just follow that up? What yeah. is it then in the neoliberal analysis that allows that? I mean, in a sense, there must be some there must be some sort of uh, antagonistic aspect within neoliberalism. <coughs> that makes this internal contestation possible. I, I guess I'm worried about the sort of hint of totalization sometimes in the neoliberal analysis. Uh, maybe I'm thinking of a sort of like cloud move, yeah, yeah. internal antagonism, yeah, no, locating I, the antagonism, that yeah. actually allows people to contest from this yeah. side. But I don't think there. I don't think there is. I, I think that um, that uh, internal. I don't. I think that within arts institutions specifically, that space of antagonism is usually aestheticized or programmed in a way. So it's not allowed to exist. I, I think one of my main uh, very simple um, observations is that actually it's the content in arts institutions that often provides the antagonism and the, uh, the, the, you know, the antagonistic, um, you know, self-reflexive um, moment, yeah? It's the kind of thing that you and I are often asked to contribute to as, as you know, academics and public intellectuals. However, I'm more interested in, 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 in a much more mundane set of um, procedures 
which will be to think about how that antagonism might work structurally in the institution rather than, so I think there's, a, there's an issue between content and structure that I'm interested in. I'm interested in moving towards structure, which is why, you know, which is why Habermas is actually quite an, an interesting tool and a useful tool, because he understands that the public sphere is, a, is something that is structurally transformative rather than about content, yeah? Sorry, long answer. Uh, yes, another question. But, um, uh, last week, uh, last week I programmed a talk for some undergraduate students that included um, uh, two contributions, one by a uh, curator from Tate, and the other one was a curator, younger curator, and um, it seemed that. <coughs> curators from the Tate still uh, needed to align themselves with a critical distance, or a space of critical distance, whereas the younger curator, <coughs> very much younger curator, um, seemed to have no problem with a space of distraction or a condensed space. And it still seems <coughs> that there's something in what you're saying that still um, requires or aligns itself or has a desire for this kind of critical distancing, whereas <clears throat> someone under 35 might say, what's the issue? Well, why, you know, why, why not uh, completely embrace this space of kind of distraction? Yeah. That what might be seemingly a non-critical space that, you know, the Habermas really worries about and, um, yeah, Benjamin worries about it, it yeah. kind of has an anxiety about it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, so two quick answers. The first one is um, that I think that what you what you call the uh, critical distance is is part of the mechanism that produces publics. So I think it's a. It, I'm I'm not embracing critical distance. I am suggesting in, in when I describe those kind of four different ways in which artwork produces the publics, one of them is through critical distancing. And in fact, I think at the moment amongst my generation, we're experiencing kind of a, a kind of nostalgia for criticality in some kind of way. So that's the first thing. Secondly. Um, uh, uh, can you repeat the question? Okay, no. I mean, I, I mean, I understood the first um, the first aspect in terms of sim uh, uh, yeah. uh, symmetization or cognitive, oh, cognitive, know, cognitive, cognitive capital. So I understand that yeah. the critique yeah. that um, you also referred to was the initial fear of somehow kind of embrace it, go with it, kind of accelerationism. So. No, I don't okay, think I am so, doing that. So I mean, I'm yes. suggesting that Michel Fair is a, is one um, is one source where that that I mean, I'm, I mean, he hasn't actually kind of exposed this idea yet, so we've yet to see right. exactly what he means by it. But it's it's a it's saying it's around, and you're right, the accelerationists also um, uh, propose this. No, I I I think we need to resist neoliberalism. It's simple. Mm. Okay. <laughs> um, because yeah. because um, otherwise we lose everything. You know, uh, you know, it, it's something that I've talked a lot with Mark Fisher about, actually, and we've just done a podcast on it, which is how um, how the spaces to imagine alternative ways, again, on a very pragmatic basis. So to go back to Michael's question of how we might run arts organisations, um, uh, we lose the capacity to imagine what those that might be. So, for instance, what would it be to rearrange the financial mechanisms of taste so everybody is paid equally. I mean, you know, just these are the things that I'm thinking about at the moment. I mean, I, I don't think Tate could do it. I mean, it could do it, obviously. But those are the kind of things that, that's what I mean by structural transformation. That would, yeah, that would, that would require complete structural yeah. transformation down to, yeah. a root, down to a root level. So, yeah. um, I mean, in a simple way, why does that begin at an art institution? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, okay, that's a good question. Because, as I said, I think arts institutions are, um, uh, have a flexibility about them, in a way, because of the reasons that I've described in terms of the arts procedure of creating publics that, that, that suggest they might be some of the first places to start. Yeah? Since yeah. it's time, could we? Just say, I think that the Michelle Fair talk is taking place in this room tomorrow on Wednesday. On Wednesday. Um, I think five, five o'clock, six o'clock. And the other ones are online. They are online. Yeah. 
Um, a couple of times, in your, in your last talk that I enjoyed very much about um, property and housing and yeah. citizenship, um, you sort of ended your talk with, again, a sort of a kind of hope for perhaps a kind of administrative restruct, yeah. which I agree with. I just wonder if it's, it's worth maybe talking about um, uh, kind of smaller unions like, for instance, the IWW, um, who, are, who are very kind of proactive in structural sabotage and actual kind of mechanisms within institutions to um, kind of reorganise energies to the detriment of administration in quite sort of practical ways to slow down bureau bureaucratic tasks, for instance. I mean, maybe it would be an answer for, you know, people for in the kind of management in s space gallery, for instance, who have just, re you know, had all their funding redirected into sort of entrepreneurial yes. residencies instead of, the, you know, what were very useful residencies, permacultures. Yeah. I mean, perhaps a way forward would actually be to kind of, you know, re redistribute that money in a way that they saw fit in answer to the demands of the artists in the area. Yeah, I agree. I mean, for me, that's, a, you know, those sorts of solutions are available, but it's, 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 it's up to, it's up to um, the organisations. But I mean, I think you have to kind of start being quite uncomfortable about what you suggest before things stop being the kind of happy, friendly, liberal um, kind of antithesis you mentioned at the start. Because otherwise it just becomes, I think, just like enacting, anyway. Yeah. But um, would, you, would you agree with those sorts of yeah, activities? I think that one of, the, one of the, the, the most important things that's happened over the past couple of years is the way in which the Precarious Workers Brigade has put pressure on arts institutions to pay their interns. And it did it very simply through a, 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 a kind of, um, you know, an activist strategy, which was to name and shame them. And, you know, uh, institutions I work with have started paying their interns. So I think there's, there's things like that, absolutely. But um, I think the structure, I'm working on a big project at the moment about arts organisation. And I think that the structure at the level of uh, the, the level of administration needs to be th thought of in really complex ways. So I agree that so, sometimes activist strategies work, but I, but but they're, in a way they're not the solution. They would conform to I think what Michael was suggesting, where a kind of outside inside thing. I mean, I mean, although you know, uh, members of the Precarious Workers Brigade at the time were working for um, uh, kind of very well known arts institutions. So you know, but um, the I think that the um, that the, the question about space and the redistribution of its money is something that space should be uh, having a discussion about internally and with its arts community. But, it, but that also entails um, lobbying the Arts Council to make sure that, to, to allow them that freedom. The Arts Council is the person that is put, that is the organization that is putting entrepreneurial, um, uh, entrepreneurial, uh, um, exigencies on all of these organisations. It's the Arts Council that's demanding that, and that's the Arts Council, of course, that has been shaped by a neoliberal government. I'm, uh, I've been working recently uh, with a text written by Paul Gilroy that was in the last edition of New Formations, which is a, 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 a sociological journal. Um, and uh, the last issue of New Formations was on new, uh, neoliberalism. And this article, it, Paul Gilroy, argues brilliantly um, that the way in which um, black culture has embraced um, meritocracy has fundamentally shifted the way in which um, debates about uh, the visibility and identity um, that he was involved in, I guess, in, in the UK in the eight, late 80s and early 90s, made them impossible to have because of a kind of meritocratic positioning and, a, um, um, and an entrepreneurial, you know, the basis of, 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 um, of um, uh, success being entrepreneurial and meritocratic. And I think the art world is an entrepreneurial and meritocratic system. I know there are many artists that don't work like that and many curators that don't work like that. But, you know, what would it be to have an institution that, that 
didn't progress meritocratically? Could we imagine it? And what would it look like? And very importantly for me, of course, and something I haven't talked about tonight, that is the other side of my research, the stuff I'm doing with Sue Hale, um, how, how would that affect the economic relationship between art, its market, and the ways in which it, it's produced and made visible through these arts institutions? Can arts institutions exist without the market economy upon which they have for so long existed? So it's, it's very complicated. So I think to think of administration is important, but not in kind of Benjamin Buchloe, you know, kind of the aesthetics of administration terms, but in, in, in the kind of very pragmatic and mundane basis of, you know, let's look at your constitution and see what it says, you know. I've been doing a lot of that recently. I think that the public sphere, as I tried, I've argued elsewhere, and I, I kind of did very quickly in here. I think the concept of the public sphere is is a is a fiction that can embrace all sorts of things. What I'm trying to argue for is not necessarily a public sphere, but a public that might be able to be more uh, determined, or might be more in charge of determining what it wants to uh, develop and produce. But yeah, the pub, I mean, I don't have anything against YouTube. I use it, as you can see. But I mean, to, to yeah, yeah, sure, but I, I guess what I'm trying to draw out is, um, yeah, what's the question? Um, so, so you end up with a kind of a framing of this in terms of art institutions, which you know, we, we, obviously that's um, crucial, we understand that. Um, but that's, of course, to frame it in terms of entities that are that, that imply forms of citizenship, uh, public funding, um, uh, governmental um, framings of the public, as, as you mentioned in detail. Um, but uh, YouTube obviously doesn't require citizenship other than ownership of access to people technology, which is far from universal, far from globally universal. It doesn't require citizenship. So um, I guess what I'm trying to make sense of is um, you know, some more kind of regulatory ideal of publicness. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking of you know, the, the, the sort of um, the enlightenment scenario you sketched being, you know, the kind of personal right of democracy traditionally associated with literacy is for newspapers. Now, newspapers are going broke, um, and trying to figure out how to make money online. Uh, something like The Guardian loses 30 million pounds a year and is, you know, depending on other forms of income, um, and so on and so on and so on. So those forms of publicness are obviously massively being eroded, and that's what you've talked about. Um, but I was thinking about something like um, uh, technological uh, forms of, of um, well, okay, so, so one response being uh, something like a kind of cultural version of um, you know, Puritans going off to America. So um, one response to these forms of foreclosure being um, Forget trying to participate in this state. We're going to go off. We, we, we can't contest this, so we're going to exit it and form our own micro public. Um, so, you know, English Puritans are excluded within the state and they go off and form their own utopian micro public. Um, so, one week we thought about that in sort of kind of balkanization of publics yeah. that's, that's enabled mm. technologically. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting question. My, my response to it is very humble, which is that 
um, in a way, my interest in our arts institutions is um, that we've got to start somewhere. And I don't agree with the idea of balkanization or the kind of Puritan thing, as you described it, although I can understand how that might be one way of doing it. And previously, for instance, I've argued, I think, as you know, for special economic zoning for arts institutions, and that is a kind of version of the Puritanism that I think you're describing. I, I'm, um, I'm kind of moving away from that. And it, interestingly, I'm moving away from that, having worked intensely with arts institutions more close up, really, over the past three years since I was thinking through those things. And it seems to me that one of the important things that arts institutions have is a kind of juridical porosity um, that is largely um, made through their engagements with artists and, uh, and, their, and their, um, their legal uh, requirements to be open to the public even if they're 85% privatized, whatever the current, um, the percentage that, that, that is baptized around and never proven of the taint. So, so I think that those things um, allow us to simply, and this is why I call it a kind of rather humble response, it, it, will be in, it will be great to be able to just open those places up experimentally to different ways of thinking through programming, for instance. So to think through different ways in which we might talk to each other, we might open up doors to people that don't usually feel like they can come into the gallery, that we might, be, it, um, we might include different types of artists, not the ones that are, um, that are, that are fetishized through the market. Okay? So I'm talking about stuff that is, that is, that is, is, is not, um, it's not rocket science. Okay? It's not, I'm just saying that actually arts institutions are places where those experiments could happen. And in that sense, they could be, um, yeah, kind of spaces of rehearsal for different ideas of the public. The most important thing, I guess, I'm trying to do is retain a conceptualization of the public. But that in order to maintain it, I might need to, re to kind of, you know, we might need to kind of drop the idea of public space, which is what I suggest in this um, Margaret Thatcher's funeral thing, and drop the idea of the public sphere as kind of constituent of it. But to understand publics as a formative civic relationship we have with each other that's important and is based on equality and freedom. And those are the things that I think that we should be rehearsing and we should be rehearsing and we could be rehearsing them in, in arts organisations. They would seem ideal places to try it and start it. We can't do it in the universities anymore. I mean I just think that we need and they're also they're also they're not difficult structurally, you know, as organisations. They're not they don't have layers of complex bureaucracy. I mean, obviously, the bigger ones have more than the smaller ones, but it's just so. It's just that it's like let's let's try let's th let's try and imagine different ways in which these might exist, not as a kind of separatist, you know, state or zone, you know, but as something that exists within a broader set of procedures that are, of course, and this goes back to Michael's question, I think, that are all, of course, you know, neoliberal. So it's not it's not suggesting that we have a separatist movement. You know, and that's that's where I would I would maybe split uh, my politics would split. I mean, you know, I I believe in unionism. I have a quick. I have a quick question. Um, I'm always concerned, much as I was fascinated by the talk, by how so much. Um, uh, so many aspects of affect and, and intimacy, intimacy seem to be occluded by the vocabulary around discussions that analyze and criticize institutions. And it seems to me that if, 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 if you set up, if you were able to succeed in setting up, establishing some sort of zone in which institutions re-engage with equal, equal communication, equal platforms for communication, then the question is, well, what, what is communicated? What is attained through that? And I, and I think even in, even, in, even in institutions like this, which you've admitted or at least invited us to imagine failing, I think what, what forms an important part of the experience of people here, besides attending a lecture like this, besides engaging in a critique of their work, is the community that they establish amongst themselves, the intimacy, intimacies that they exchange, the particular kinds of vocabularies and, la and languages that they develop to discuss their experiences and their work, that are not subject to the regimes that we are always trying to contest. And when you include quotes like this, <clears throat> um, 
and I suspect that ultra red are, are veering in this direction, I find that it, it feels incumbent to look at the work that these people are making, to analyze it, to account for it, and say, well, this is what they'd like to be doing, but, and the work actually achieves far more in excess of this, or it achieves the following, uh, the following levels of success in terms of communication, intimacy, and intoxication. Um, and without the examples of those works, I find the, the discourse remains very much within, it seems, the apparatus that you seem to want to take apart and, mm -hmm. and critique. Mm -hmm. So you criticize him for not showing any examples of artwork? And not expanding the vocabulary and the language that he used to yeah. understand the achievements of his I'm organization. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, of course, yes. We, I mean, you know, you know the, 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 the question of like how, how, you know, what you, how much time you've got to do. I've already taken up too much time. Uh, so, um, yeah, of course, we need to. I mean, the reason I, I, I ended with Alice and Andreas's quote is precisely for this reason. I didn't show you an image of their work. Their work is so complex that it would take me two hours to describe. I mean, I don't know if anybody saw the Potosi Principle, for instance. Extraordinarily important and complex exhibition that, that was very, I mean, that very much inspired me to think in organizational terms, actually. Um, uh, but um, the reason that I'm interested in this is because they, they identify, because they're ultra-red are different, ultra-red of kind of, I mean, although they, they, their work is shown in exhibitions and biennales, it doesn't sit easily and often fails in those contexts. Whereas Andres, Andreas and um, Alice are, are, operate very successfully, you know, as, as image producers, as libidinal and effective image producers. And that's why I'm interested, that's why I kind of left it with this. I didn't say that. Siegman and Kreischer are very effective and libidinal um, image producers. And I encourage you all to go and um, and, and, and see the work. I mean, I genuinely, you know, I'm not doing this because I hate art. Um, I'm doing it because um, I think that I've learned much of what I know from art, and I just want it to be able to be communicated in ways that aren't um, elite formations of knowledge production, but are much more open. And I understand and believe that most of the artists I work with want that too. So we just need the institutions to be able to do it, and we need to reformulate the art market in order to do it as well. It's those two things. Can I do one really short last question? Because I was, I'm, I'm getting a bit worried. Maybe I misunderstood, but I'm not sure. Um, you were saying that the artist uh, has this moment of producing a work, which is a private moment, and then the curator helps him to get this work into the mm -hmm. public sphere. Um, isn't that a slightly bit of an old-fashioned idea? And also, um, um, and I, I, I wonder, like, why you keep focusing so much on the institutions and why you're not addressing the the role of the artist in that sense? And also because we artists we work as well in a neoliberal society, and therefore the way we relate to the public has totally changed. Yeah, I think I describe I tried to describe that in in my lecture. Uh, with the four ways in which I suggested an artist's work. So the first question is, it seems to me there's two parts in that question. The first question is, um, is it not a bit old-fashioned to, to, to talk about this kind of revelation from the private to the public in the way that the artist works, yeah? Mm. Is that what I understand? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I know that, uh, I'd like to think it was old-fashioned, but I don't think it is. I think that, that actually, whilst um, I know there are many artists that work collaboratively and collectively, et cetera, et cetera, the, the way in which um, art is economized and financialized and the way it is, um, uh, the way it is structured um, uh, in a kind of temporal and spatial way still requires that to happen. However, you know, I mean, I, I recognize there are, there are people trying to do things differently, but however, we still go to art openings. We still have the moment where things are, are revealed to us, yeah? I mean, even, you know, at the Berlin Biennial, you know, a um, couple of years ago, where there was a kind of engagement with the Occupy movement, et cetera, et cetera, there was still the kind of structural transformation hadn't occurred. The content uh, transformation was being uh, attempted to be changed. So, I, so I, I don't agree with you as old-fashioned. I think it still structures the way that we think and um, experience art. 
And there was a second section, second part of your question. I can't remember what it was. Sorry. Um, why do you keep addressing this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why, yeah. Why institutions and not the artists? The role of artists. Well, I did talk about artists. So, no, I mean, no, I did talk about artists, but I, um, but, but because I, because I'm particularly interested in the way that we might use art institutions to develop different strategies of displaying, experiencing, um, being affected by, and negotiating alongside the productions that artists make, the productions that curators make, the production that all sorts of different people make. So I'm interested, my, my particular interest is in our institutions, which is not to say that uh, we can have the same conversation about artists, but I didn't talk about artists. Mm, okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Ooh, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> <Like> this? <coughs> Sorry. I was, Sorry. I was thinking about the the way that Eric Sobo talked about the present in the, in the exhibition and how the knowledge be present at the moment of the visualizing and different principles. That's uh, a way to solve in that with the kind of uh, pre-established organizations for the protection of the type of art or the way that uh, how, how they smuggle other principle to the principles to inside the institution that made them re that make them operate and then the way that it, it made the most of the things that operate in a in a way that it, it have it come in and it became a present for the and the, the knowledge will be a present of the the, the, the time of, of the VV and it, and sharing and participating. Did, don't you think that, that, that uh, because I was looking at a different type, because the, the festivals as a type of the public sphere where the power of the public direct uh, activities or some other types of the activity which is a public and they are not or get so much even they are organized organized but then the, there is a power that comes from inside the the, the activity and the, the event that, that reshaped the whole activity. I think I, I was, because I was looking at that, there was a research about the performative democracy, about the performative democracy uh, circle table in Poland, which is, uh, I mean, because I was searching about this other format when the that at the same time, the organization is producing a systematic, but then they are producing the meaning at the moment that it became, uh, it, it came out from the like uh, traditional way of revealing and mm -hmm. um, immanent meaning, and instead of it, it's uh, the meaning is itself inside the place and at that time. Um, if I understand what you're saying, I think there are institutional experiments. Are there experiments, not I mean, experiments outside the institution as well. I think Former West is a good example of this, um, which might not be exactly what you're talking about about the Polish Round Table, but I mean that there are uh, experimental formats that people have set up, and um, in fact. Uh, uh, Maria Havelova, who um, runs back in Utrecht, has said that she's um, she's n not interested in having any members of the public in her gallery at all. So that you know, and she mm. she's trying to she's trying to argue. Uh, I think that there's. I mean, I think I agree with a lot of, a lot of things she's trying to do, and she's trying to argue that um, that, that that against the kind of <coughs> the ways in which arts institutions are, are um, funded, particularly in the Netherlands, and particularly at the moment that is making this demand on the number of people, bodies through the door effectively. So she's kind of as a form of uh, criticism of that on a practical basis said in, in her funding applications, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I, I, I'm not bothered, I'm not gonna count who comes in. So I think there are you know, lots of different ways of, of, of um, resisting it or trying to promote change within it. Some of which comes from, as you say, kind of, I mean, there's lots of different ways of using formats to think it through. It might be as, a, as an experiment in a festival. It might be through a kind of small scale, um, uh, self-funded, uh, you know, event that you try and work out collaboratively with some colleagues. I'm not suggesting that any of that is um, bad or useless or wrong. 
Uh, of my interest is in um, is in thinking of um, the public as a kind of civic concept, which embraces certain statist forms. So I'm not interested in thinking an alternative to the state. I'm thinking about making the state a, a, a more conducive space to produce democracy and to practice democracies, and how art can help with that. So I'm so I guess in, in the kind of range of kind of public um, or political. Um, shapes, mine is quite conventional in a sense, that I think that uh, there is something to be argued for in um, us uh, mobilizing ourselves in order to change state policy. So, um, uh, so rather, but that's not to say that these um, experiments aren't useful and interesting and we can't learn from them. I learn from them a lot. Yeah. I think we'll have to end yes. there, but before we thank Andrea, could I invite you to come to the Royal Grove Baths and uh, support the MFA program and <laughs> having a drink. Um, that was great, Andrea. Thank you very much. Yeah.